Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by... Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. Today, I am your host, Ryan Rempersad, and I will be sharing my experience with the Samsung Galaxy Note 9. Find the show notes for this episode at the nexus.tv slash SO50. So let's get started with models and pricing. So the phone pricing for the Note 9 is a little bit high. So it starts at $1,000 for 128 gigs and six gigs of RAM. So what's interesting about that is think about this from a pre-upgraded perspective. So the baseline model could have been 64 gigs and it could have cost $900, just like the uh, only tier of S9 Plus that was available in the US earlier this year, but they just gave you a hundred gig, or you know, they just gave you that double uh, for free by making it a thousand dollars. But it doesn't end there, of course, because there's another model for the Note 9, oddly enough, and it is 1249 for not 256 gigs, but 512 uh, gigabytes of storage. And of course, um, if that made it easy enough to decide, well, 128 gigs or 512, no. The difference, of course, is between the two variants is six gigabytes of RAM or eight gigabytes of RAM. So not only do you have to choose which one do you want more in terms of storage, but for $250, you have to also decide if you want additional memory in your phone. So we'll talk a little bit later about what the performance of this phone is like and what the profiles are for the two variants, but it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. So I was able to turn my original Galaxy S8 Plus, the one that I bought in 2017, into Best Buy as a trade-in for about $450. So my $1,000 phone cost about $600 after tax, after I turned in my previous phone. And so you know me, my phones are in very pristine condition. I barely use them before I stop using them and buy another one. That's just how it goes, right? Well, it's great to be able to trade in. Now, if you're listening to this in the future and you're thinking, oh, well, you'll just trade in your phone for $400 and you'll be uh, buying a phone for half off, basically. Well, it's unlikely. So as far as I can tell, the 450 350 250 trade-in offers were really only available during the first month of sale. And I'm recording this about a month out, and I think it's kind of done now. I think the sales are pretty much winding down in terms of trade-in value. Think about what that means in the market. There is going to be a swarm of S8s and S8 Pluses out there because this is the kind of the talk here in a way. It will most likely go down in price. There will most likely be a sale around Thanksgiving and for the holiday season this year, at least in the US. And you might see it get down to $800, but we'll see. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on here? I think we're getting some sort of interference that's preventing me from being able to broadcast to you all. Maybe I can, let's see if I can fix it out of here. Boost the signal a little bit. So let's talk about some of the actual things about this phone. Let's start with the display. So the display is beautiful, of course, just like the S8 and the S9 before it. It's actually better than the S8 definitively, and I think it might be a tad bit worse than the S9 Plus, but only because it's a physically bigger display, so the display resolution decreased uh, proportionally. So I believe the S9 Plus is a 6.1 inch display, don't quote me on that, and this phone, the Note 9, is 6.4. So also don't quote me on this, but what I've heard is that there is uh, a debate going on on whether this phone, the Note 9, is as big or bigger than the iPhone XS Max. I had, to, I had to really hone in on that name because Note 9 is so simple to say, but the iPhone lineup, ironically, now is no longer that simple to say. So this phone looks just as good as previous phones uh, in terms of uh, Galaxy displays have uh, go. Some special features, of course, uh, on the display side of things. Um, there's a few. Ambient display, which is called always-on display in the Samsung software. It's wonderful. I mean, you can't go wrong with this. It's uh, it's very. It's always on. It tells you the time. It tells you uh, the date. Tells you the battery life left. Um, 
it's very nice. And it'll also show little um, icons if you need to know what notifications you have. Uh, it also has some features that I've turned off, but that are kind of cool. So on the off mode of the screen, there's a pressure sensitive portion of the screen. That's sort of like a 3D touch almost, but it's basically you press the screen in one area and then you can just wake it up. So you don't even have to use the power button if you don't want to. Uh, I have that turned on, but the feature that I have turned off is called edge lighting. And it's basically a way so that if your phone's on your desk but muted, you can have color-coded, not just an LED, but a color-coded ring along the edges of your phone display. And of course, the Note line and the S8 line and S9 line have had these curved screen edges, and they look beautiful when they're lit in a particular way. And since this is an OLED screen, it can light up parts of the screen without having to use all your battery life, which is great. So I don't need that feature. My phone volume isn't off. And usually my phone's on my desk, so I'll know if something happens. Look and feel of this phone is kind of interesting. So why didn't they have black? Why was the color choice blue and lilac? Well, we may never know. Uh, I believe black was sold elsewhere in the world, just not here in the U.S. So that's that's an odd decision. Mine's blue. Um, we'll talk about what, more about what that means later, but mine is blue. Uh, you know, so I had the Note 9 uh, for about a month now, and I had the S8 9, or I had the S8 and the S9 for some period of time at least, and the Note feels a little bit squarer. So the Note has sort of this hard, square, rounded, wrecked edges at the top and bottom, whereas the 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 S8 and S9 sort of had a more of a curve. It had more, more it was more rounded on the on the corners. Uh, you know, it's it's not really a big deal either way. I'm I'm guessing they did this so that they could squeeze in some more space. Um, you know, it's it's kind of interesting. The the um, S9 had this particular design change that was captivating to say the least and it was this this metal band that separated the back glass from the front glass and because that phone had um black on it instead of blue it was kind of easier to tell that this was the case because the the, the glass and the the metal didn't match so much but on this phone the band is still there it's much narrower in this one and we'll, we'll discuss why about that in a moment but it's it's not nearly as sharp the S9 had an incredibly sharp, it's hard to describe, but it was just extremely sharp uh, when you ran your fingers over it. Um, and because those edges were so sharp, um, you put put it in a case and you wouldn't really notice anymore. But when you would run your hands over it, when you didn't have a case, you would kind of feel like it was a little bit too sharp. Um, so maybe, maybe they um, just iterated on that and it's okay now. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned is about why why the metal band is so much thinner now is because I think, and I, and I don't have definitive proof because my S9 Plus is sitting somewhere far, far away, is that the curve on the glass display is so much shallower on the Note than on the uh, S line. And maybe that is because they need to pack more space in there and they didn't want to make the phone too much wider, or they've received feedback that the aggressive curve, I guess you might say, where the curve almost seems to bulge out from the phone proper, maybe they've figured that's not as uh, viable as they once thought. Um, or maybe the Note line just has a different design aesthetic. I'm not sure. I've never had a previous Note. Um, but it's kind of interesting to compare the two. Like, if you look at pictures, you'll see that the curves are just so different. Let's talk about the build and construction a little bit. So, We've talked about the metal band that runs across the sides of the phone and into uh, the bottom and top, and then, of course, it separates the back and front glasses. So all of that's great, and I, um, I'm okay with it. Now, it's a little bit heavier, so it's heavier. So I know that when I hold it up, like freestanding, my arm is not resting on anything, it's heavier. I know it. Uh, I don't know how much heavier it is than the previous phone, but it certainly is. And it took me about a week to get used to it holding it in my hand because it does require a little bit more oomph to get it going once you start trying to hold it. Now, construction-wise, it's still solid. There's no rattle on any of the buttons. There's no there's no shifting. There's no bending. There's no bend gate. There's nothing. I mean, it's it's just a solid slab of glass, 
and good old-fashioned working cell phone. Oh, wait a minute. I figure out what's going on. Ryan's taking over the show. He's blocking my broadcast and making his own episode without telling me. Oh, that no good, dirty, rotten. Ugh. CPU. Well, you know, it's from our friends at Qualcomm. It's a Snapdragon 845. Now, I don't know about this for sure, but I believe that the Snapdragon 845 was the same chip used in the earlier this year phone, the S9. So that means between those five months or so, there was no difference in processor tech, Um, which in my opinion is a shame, a vast shame, a great shame. Now, one difference to note is that because this phone is bigger and Samsung added an incredibly aggressive copper heat pipe inside, it probably has a little bit more thermal headroom than the previous phone, which means that maybe it might have like 5% better performance in everyday tasks and maybe 20% better performance in something a little bit more power intensive. Maybe. I'm not sure. Um, Interestingly, it has 6 gigs of RAM. The S9 Plus had also 6 gigs of RAM, so did it matter? I don't know. So the real upgrade would have been to pay the $1,200 and $50 to to get that other variant, but of course that's kind of absurd. Now the storage inside of this phone is 128 gigabytes, which is great storage. My previous phones have always been 64 gigs, except the Pixel 1. Uh, that was a lot of money, though. That was almost a thousand dollars, ironically, and that was two years ago. Um, but of course, because it's a Samsung phone, you get the wonderful and exclusive capability of using a micro SD card. So I've loaded mine up with a 64 gigabyte card, and it works great. Uh, the the storage options for these for these phones are, are really nice. Um, and of course, if you get the 512 version of the Note 9 you can put up to a 512 gigabyte card into it, giving you roughly a terabyte of storage to use. Now, in the software, there are some things that will not allow you to actually use the card. So, for example, if you want to take burst photography shots, the camera will outright say, yeah, you can't do that onto the card. But, of course, that's okay because you can take those shots, put them onto your internal storage, and then just move them right right on over to the uh, micro SD card whenever you need to. Ah, battery life. So the Note line has historically been the bigger screen, which means more power usage, right? Well, and I and I agree, but my my evidence was showing that the Note Nine has better battery life than the S Nine Plus, and the S Nine Plus had better battery life than the S Eight Plus. The S8 Plus had better battery life than the Pixel 1, which means that every time I got a bigger screen, the battery life also went up. Totally a coincidence, probably, maybe. No, this year, Samsung has put a 4,000 mAh battery into this phone, and it is uh, adequate. You know, if if Samsung had um, done true innovation, they could have put in a 4,500 mAh battery, and I truly could have had... 60% 60% on my second day of usage. That would have been amazing. So if I could truly not need to charge for a whole two days. Now, to be fair, uh, I've been using this for about a month now. It took about a week for the phone to learn my usage patterns, or at least that's what the folks on the Reddit say. And I end my days, at least my average days, with about 40%. So it can be anywhere from 40 to 50% but usually it's on the lower side of the 40s. And there have been some nights where I've decided, you know, I don't need to plug this in. I'll, I'll let it uh, just drain it out a little bit more. And um, there's nothing like Matt's Deep Cycle Sunday, but maybe there is a there is a little bit of wisdom on just not always charging your phone if you don't have to. So I guess there's that. Now, on some of the days, I, uh, I, will, I will try to do something a little different just to see what the battery does. So lately I've been trying to do my twice daily navigation, so my twice daily 45 minute trips to work and to home, um, without plugging the phone into the car's um, power outlet. So when I do that, it'll obviously take quite a bit of power to do do, uh, live tracking and 
live GPS navigation, but it's not as aggressively bad as it had been with the with the S8 certainly in the S9 uh, prior. So it's a, it's better, but it's not much better. Now as far as as far as my mornings go, um, I've always had this thing that I do in every morning, and it's basically read all the news you can before you have to leave for work. So on previous phones, I noticed that I would get down to 94% before I left. And so it was about 45 minutes of browsing. You know, I've got to check the Reddit, the Hacker News, the Twitter, the e both emails, and, um, you know, whatever other notifications I might have gotten overnight from Slack. So there's some work to do in the morning. And, and when I do that, it was getting down, on, especially on the S8, but even on the uh, S9 Plus, it was certainly getting down there. This phone will get me to about 98%, and then I'll wrap up and go to work. Um, one of the things that I'll mention about this phone, uh, we don't have a section for this, and we really should, um, is about connectivity. So I noticed when I received the S9 Plus earlier this year that my signal and my reception skyrocketed. Um, I had never been able to place a call in the elevators at my office. And suddenly with that phone, I started to be able to place calls in the elevator. Never happened before. Very cool. With this phone, I feel like there was a little bit of signal loss. Now, it's totally uh, non-scientific, but it kind of feels that way. So given that, that kind of signal reception difference, um, and also where I'm working in the office now, so I've moved from the fifth floor back in February down to the second floor, uh, back in June, and this, of course, this phone was purchased in August. Um, the signal difference is great physically where I am. So my phone's almost always searching for signal uh, on the second floor of my office building, which means that my battery life will also be a little bit worse um, than if it were in a better-to-reach signal location. Okay, let's see. Maybe I can turn the tables on Ryan here. If I just reverse the polarity, maybe I can block his signal and continue with my episode. Ports. Let's talk about ports. Ports are good. The audio jack. Hey, at least this phone has one, right? So the audio jack is on the bottom of the phone adjacent to the micro USB port. Wait, I mean USB type C port because it's not an ancient phone. Um, but at least it has an audio jack, right? Uh, this has USB type C. It has quick charge. Uh, it also has um, Qi charging, uh, which I don't use much, but it is kind of a cool feature when I do need it or do use it. Not much to say here on, on the ports and charging, but it's uh, standard. Let's talk about buttons. The Bixby button in particular. The Bixby button is back. It's still there. After three phones, it's still there, and it's still basically useless. Hi, Bixby. Yeah, that's what I thought. So the Bixby button is still on the left side of the phone. Now, because this is such a bigger phone, or at least it thinks it is, uh, compared to the S8 and S9 Plus, the Bixby button is a little bit higher up. And so I almost never put my finger anywhere near it. In fact, I have to shimmy all the way up and even to get up to where that might be. And I kind of dismiss it because that's just how my fingers line up. They go right to the volume rocker. So the Bixby button, this time at least, is almost in a perfect place for me to ignore it. Um, so that's nice. The Bixby button has sort of changed. I mean, it's still a button, obviously. Um, it's a smooth button. Nothing physically has changed. But the interior of how it works, the, um, what do you call that, software? The software has changed sort of for the worse. Um, the software makes no sense. So for whatever reason, the software now has Bixby... Um, single press open the Bixby home screen, I guess. And then it doesn't have anything useful on it. It used to be able to have settings and it would show you the weather and it would show you useful stuff. Now it just shows you a bunch of instructions, like canned instructions, no less, on what you could do with Bixby, which is almost nothing. I don't want to call anyone Bixby. Um, sometimes the phone will hear the word Bixby, very similar to how the Google Home will hear hey, Google, and suddenly decide to wake up for no reason. So I don't know what's going on there. Now, as for the other buttons on the phone, of course, you have your regular volume rockers on the left side, and of course, you have your regular power button on the right side. None of the buttons have any unique texture. That's the one thing I kind of miss and would like to have on one of these Samsung phones. It's really nice when a primary button 
or at least even the Bixby button has a unique texture so that you can kind of just feel for it and know exactly which one you want. Um, one thing that also annoys me is that the power button is not symmetric on the phone sides with the Bixby button, and the power button is also not symmetrically centered with the ro volume rockers. So no matter what you do, none of the buttons are symmetric across. Now, maybe there's a reason for that, and I don't know what it is, uh, like some kind of accessibility reason, but I don't like it. Ugh, it's no good. Why can't I beat him? Wait a minute. What? His signal is coming from inside the studio? But, but that means that he's... So, you like taking pictures, right? Well, let's talk about the camera then. You know, I can't say for sure. So I've had it for about a month, and I've taken my fair share of dog pictures because that's all I take pictures of, really. A couple cat pictures here and there, I guess. In optimal conditions, I think it takes just as good photos as the S9 was taking when I was using that full-time. But in less optimal conditions, it feels like, and I'm not convinced that I'm 100% sure, because even the S9 suffered from this occasionally, but the Note 9 seems to suffer from really bad blurring problems. And I don't know what that means. So if the dog is moving, or if it's kind of dim out, or kind of dim inside, the blur just gets insane. And I don't know if there's something it can do better or not. Um, now, I, I, I know you can go into Pro Mode, and of course you can set the, um, photo, the, 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 the photo duration. Uh, the shutter speed of how much you need to let light in for. Uh, and I guess just in auto mode, for whatever reason, Samsung has it tuned so that it doesn't stay open longer for the variety of situations where it should, such as there's something moving fast in the frame. Um, now, of course, when you're in the viewfinder and you're taking a photo, it looks beautiful. But then when you take it and you review those photos, half the picture will be in focus the other half will just be a blur of dog fur, and I don't know, maybe there's some other setting that I'm missing, but it's not right. Now, out of the box, there is something called the Scene Optimizer. Now, the Scene Optimizer is a setting that is supposed to analyze with Bixby Magic or whatever, whatever it is you're taking a picture of. So if you're taking a picture of your dinner, it's supposed to change it so that your food looks more delicious. If you're taking a picture of your dog, it's supposed to make your dog look cuter. Now... I turned that off because I don't want it doing that. I want to just take normally good, plain pictures. So, I don't know. We'll see if it makes a difference in the long run, but I've turned it off. Now, obviously, months apart, the sky is clearer in winter. In February, when I bought the S9 Plus, there was a particularly nice night out, and I went outside and I took some pictures of the space sky that we have above uh, most places on Earth, at least. And... I was able to take a really nice picture using Pro Mode of a local constellation, which was really neat. I took a picture of the Big Dipper. Um, and to, for a little handheld phone to take such a nice picture, even in Pro Mode, I thought that was impressive. Now, I tried the same thing in August with the Note 9. Now, of course, in August, it's summer, it's humid, it's hot, the atmosphere is going to be hazier by definition. Maybe it wasn't the phone's fault, but I was not able to take an equivalently nice picture with the Note 9. So I'll mention one more thing about this camera. This phone does share the same kind of dynamic two-stage aperture. So this can change the physical aperture um, opening um, for, for one of the lenses. I'm not sure which one. It must be the bigger one here. Um, okay, there's one, one, more, one, one more thing. Now, here's the two more, one more things. So, there's two cameras on the back of the phone, of course, because every phone now, uh, at the flagship size, needs to have two cameras. Um, there's also the the other camera, which is, what, the zoomed-up one, I guess? Um, now, on my phone, it doesn't look bad, but on some people's phones, people have taken pictures of their Note 9s, it looks like the lens inside is off-center, and what I've been told is that that is normal and okay. When the camera is activated, the um, optical image stabilization sensors will recalibrate the location of the camera and fix it so that it actually becomes centered again. It just looks really bizarre that when you buy a $1,000 camera, one of the two cameras is off-center. That's weird, and I don't recommend doing that Samsung. 
bad Samsung. Oh, right, Ryan, you win this time, but I vow I'll be back and you'll be sorry. Hey, did you know the Note 9 has a pen? Well, you're wrong. It doesn't have a pen, it has a spen. That's right, a spen, an S pen. Now, the, the, um,. S8 Plus and the S9 Plus, of course, don't come with pens. They're part of the S line, uh, which is short for simple, I guess. I don't know. Um, the Note line, of course, has this pen, and it's supposed to allow you to more accurately touch your bigger screen. Um, so I've actually been trying it out lately. Um, you know, during a meeting, instead of drawing on a sticky note, I'll draw on my phone. Um, okay, yeah, that's pretty much all I've been able to do with it, really. Um, I was able to sketch out some document, like, um, sketch out a little diagram and then just send it to somebody on Slack. And that was a really neat way to do it because I don't have a good art software on my Mac for work. And I don't have a good art software on my phone otherwise. So using the built-in software for the pen, um, which is basically drawing, right? It's on a note. And then you can just save it as an image and just send it away. That's really cool. It's just easy. Now, the pen itself, wow, I mean, it's a $1,000 phone, and I'm sure the pen doesn't really cost that much to make, but they could have spent a dollar less on the phone and $5 extra on the pen, because this thing is flimsy. Mine is yellow. It has a horribly gaudy gold, um, I don't know, whatever the opposite of the tip is, I guess. Um, and, of course, the, the, the clicker, The clicker is blue because that's what's physically outside of the phone. So it uses sort of a push mechanic. So you push the clicker in and the pen will pop out. Um, so this pen is yellow. It looks awful. I don't know what Samsung was thinking. They could have made it black. Or they could have had more than one pen color. Uh, and you could just buy the pen separately. I don't know what they were thinking. Okay, so it can draw on the screen. I wish it had some more functions. So, for example, I wish I could somehow, and I don't know how this would work, I wish I could just, like, jiggle my pen in some way so that I could fast scroll without having to touch the screen. So one hand could hold the phone, or I could even put the phone on my phone cradle, and I could just take the pen and I could just, I don't know, like, run a finger on one side or the other side, and it would either scroll up or down. I wish there were some more functionalities with the pen. Now, that being said, aside from the drawing, it does have an actual button on the pen and not the clicker. The clicker's fun, but that's not it. Um, it has a button. The button is for something. So the, the, the only feature that could possibly be useful is either the... Nope, nope. The only feature that's really useful is the shutter button feature. So if you long press the pen, you'll go into camera mode. And then you can take a remote photo, which is really neat. And if you double press the button, you can switch back into the selfie mode, or you can switch again back into regular shooting mode. So it's really cool that you can trigger with bl the Bluetooth pen the remote shutter. But is that really all that it can do? Couldn't I have just asked Bixby, like, hey, take a picture? It's funny how that didn't work. So... Uh, the other feature of the pen, which is, I guess, an improvement over previous generations, is that now because it's Bluetooth, if you take your pen out during a meeting and it accidentally gets lost under some papers and you walk away, your phone will start to yell at you. Um, so that's cool, I guess. Maybe. Let's talk about software. So there's no TouchWiz. Just like since the S8 line, when the Samsung phones started becoming good again, there's no TouchWiz. TouchWiz is done, gone, and over. It's packed with settings. The whole operating system is itself, at the core, is packed with settings that differentiate itself among other vendors' Android flavors, and especially against plain stock Android, or at least Google Android, for what that's worth now. it's There's, there's a ton of cool stuff that the hardware enables it to do, so you can c customize the always-on display significantly. You can have more than just one type of clock. You can have an analog clock. You can have a picture of your dog um, jump around. You can show a little album if you want. You can have it show the weather. You can ha have it show two calendars worth of events and then some tasks that are upcoming on the calendar. 
you can do so much. You can configure the edge lighting so when you get a notification from a particular app or from a set of apps or a type of notification from any apps, it can light up different colors in different orders. There's endless configurations. Of course, this has two speakers. It has the bottom speaker and the front-facing speaker to emulate stereo. Even sound has settings. It has a Dolby Atmos thing, which means it can play better music, I guess. Everything is a setting somewhere. Um, there's one of my favorite settings that you don't think you need, and you don't because you shouldn't need it, but they have it, and if you do need it, it's an auto-restart feature. So you can have your phone, your Note 9, always restart at 2 p.m. every Saturday, which is kind of the ideal time to do it because what are you doing at 2 p.m. on a Saturday? In terms of updates, I've already received one update since I purchased it in August. Allegedly, later in this fall, we'll be getting an update that massively overhauls Bixby 2, which is this new weird Bixby that isn't as good as the previous one. And it might even be something where we can turn that button's Bixby-ness off and replace it with something useful like the Google Assistant. The Android Pie update, Android Pie has been released as of now uh, in September, but of course, this phone won't get it until at least next March, if not later, because Samsung is incapable of releasing updates in any timely fashion. Now, we could all be surprised, and suddenly, in October, Samsung could say, okay, here's the beta for Android Pie. I will not be surprised, because that won't happen. Performance is pretty good, I think. Compared to the S9+, Plus, pretty much the same, to be honest. Now, of course, compared to the S8+, Plus, which is two years old now, way different. Super fast compared to that. Compared to the, even the Pixel 1, this is actually pretty much just faster. So I have read that a lot of people still don't like how slow the animations are in Android on this phone. Now, I don't use the stock launcher. I use Action Launcher, which means the animations are just different for me anyway. So I don't notice them, and I don't have a problem with them. So maybe give, give a different launcher a try if you don't like the stock launcher. Now, here are some other things that I have noticed. So out of the box, the phone comes with its default configuration, right? So it comes with Samsung Pay unenabled, but waiting for you to do so. It comes with the um, S sidebar thing, uh, S drawer. I'm not sure what it's called. It's a little drawer that you can just drag out and, you know, it's kind of always present. So if you want to switch apps or put contacts in there or... Do whatever you want. You can do it. There's a ton of stuff that's just on by default that I don't want, but I think if a normal consumer were to buy this phone and those things weren't on by default, they would be hard-pressed to find which one of two dozen different feature buttons turn that thing on. So in some ways, it helps with the discoverability. It's easier to turn something off in this case than turn it on if you're a normal person, but for somebody a little bit more advanced and who's had Samsung phones before it didn't really help me one way or the other. It was sort of just kind of weird. Oh, well, I guess that if I can't beat him, I might as well join him. I'll just listen along to the episode with the rest of you and enjoy the show. Let me just tell you about one more quip, and then we'll wrap up. So the fingerprint sensor. Okay, so for years, the dream has been for a Note to be the flagship phone of Samsung and to include the rumored and illustrious in-screen fingerprint sensor. We didn't get that this year. So the S8 Plus had two cameras, of course, side by side. And then, well, actually, no, the S8 Plus had only one camera. And then side by side with it was the fingerprint sensor. Okay, so the problem with that was that you would hit the camera as you were trying to reach for the fingerprint sensor. Or otherwise you would just slip right into it. So it was bad. Bad location. The S9 fixed a little bit by vertically stacking them with camera one, then camera two, and then fingerprint sensor. The Note 9 compromises even further by having a horizontal stack for the two cameras and LED and a health monitor. So it's camera one, camera two, and then below those, centered, is the fingerprint sensor. Now this would be good but it's still too close to the camera. So you put your finger into the fingerprint sensor and 
you you invariably your finger almost always hits the 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 camera glass in some way or not so no matter what you do you just cannot win with samsung's fingerprint sensor placement maybe the hope and dream is still alive and will in fact get it with the next samsung phone so before we end we have to also talk about kind of a secret feature that's sort of in the note 9 that has been present in some of the other S line phones and the previous Note 8 phone, but this time it's a little different and a little bit more accessible, even though it's a secret feature. And of course, I'm talking about DeX. So DeX is a mode that is kind of similar to Chrome OS, but built into the phone's OS. So you get to, with the Note 9, plug a USB Type C connector to HDMI or DisplayPort and plug that into a screen of some sort, a TV or a monitor, and then your phone, your Note 9, will switch modes. And it'll basically in become a little computer, portable computer, for your use. Uh, basically, you get a desktop and you have a bunch of little icons on your computer. The clock is in the corner. It's kind of like uh, Chrome OS uh, is on a laptop but instead it's on a phone so the phone itself becomes a little trackpad if you need to use the keyboard the keyboard on the phone will pop up you can just make it go away by clicking off of the keyboard and the trackpad uh, screen will come back up instead you can um, open whatever apps you want basically so for example I opened Flamingo my Twitter app and it opened Flamingo in a sort of um, a portrait little window screen um, sort of phone sized on my 27 inch monitor at work um, and then I could also have Google Docs open side by side I could open uh, Google Sheets I could open a bunch of different apps uh, and I guess that's cool and fun so the difference between previous generations of DeX and this generation of DeX on the Note 9 is that it no longer requires a special dock or charging station so there's pros and cons of that, but let's just take it slow. So the pro of that is you don't need to spend an extra $100 on the special station thing that you would either plug in, I think that was the first generation, or you would have um, wireless charging provide additional power, and it would have a special fan built in to keep the phone cool enough. So with the Note 9, because it has this extra heat pipe, um, and thermal capacity, it doesn't need to do any of that anymore. You can just plug your Type-C to HDMI cable directly in, and it can just go into DeX mode, and it's just fine. No problem now. So what's cool about all of this, though, is it's a really neat feature for the 1% of people who even know it exists, but I don't even know how practical it is uh, on the other side of things. So you can, of course, pair a USB, uh, you can, uh, you can pair uh, a Bluetooth mouse with this, a Bluetooth keyboard, and it'll become like a little computer. But, of course, you have to be in an ecosystem um, in, your, in, your, in your work where you can use apps on Android for your work. So, where I am at work, we don't get to use Android apps, really, to do our work. We're all in the office ecosystem and there are of course office apps you can use for android but you have to be authenticated um and all sorts of stuff so i would never do that on my phone um but you can do google docs just fine it's actually really really fluid really slick uh especially when you pair a real keyboard um otherwise the little on-screen keyboard's kind of obnoxious um so dex is pretty cool and it's a feature worth worth mentioning it's just not extremely practical now, I hope that um, more phones in the future actually make better use of this. And it's kind of like that dream of Chrome OS. So Chrome OS is a desktop OS, but it has phone OS components in it. You can just load your phone app, whatever you want. This goes the other way around, where DeX allows you to have a phone and put desktop-like apps onto it. And when you have a desktop-like environment, a screen you can just go and attach it. It's cool. So you can kind of take your entire setup, if you will, with you. Now, of course, one of the downsides, because the Note 9 doesn't require 
the the docking station anymore is that there's no default way to charge when you're using your only type C port for display out. So that means if you need to charge, you, need, you either need a special dongle to provide type C charging and HDMI, which I don't know if that even exists, or more likely, you'll need some type of wireless charging device to do it instead. So either way, Either with the dock of the previous generations or the new way without the dock, it's pretty cool. Um, so one of the questions that I that I have remaining about Dex is if you can find an old Note 8 dock and use it with the Note 9, uh, that'd be really cool. I'm not sure if that's how it works or not. So definitely take a look at Dex, but don't expect to use it too much. Final thoughts. So for a thousand dollars. I don't know if I'd buy this phone if I had an equivalent phone already in my pocket. I did, but if I didn't have that, so if I didn't have an S9 Plus already, I probably wouldn't buy this. There's there's a lot to like here. Um, if you like a big phone, if you want to have a pen thing, if you want to have a good enough camera, if you want a boatload of internal storage on the Android side um, with the capability of having a removable storage... This phone is wonderful. I mean, this this checks every box you can think of and more, and it's a pretty big box on its own. But if you want to save some money, the S9 Plus, you can get that for about $650 right now. And going throughout the year and until we hit the S10 announcement, um, either later this year, I hope not though, or more likely early spring next year, seriously, just get the S9 Plus because it's going to be $400 cheaper and almost identically the same in every way, except the pen won't be there, and you won't be able to get it in 512 gigabytes of storage versions. Um, and you'll be able to get it in black, so maybe that's even better. That's the Samsung Galaxy Note 9 for 2018. Now, of course, I've purchased a lot of phones already this year, too, and I am trying not to purchase a fourth one. So if the Galaxy 10 comes out this year, well, it's not going to be good. So let's hope that comes out next March instead. Now this phone was really good and I hope you enjoyed listening to me talk about it for quite a while. Now if you want to listen to other phone reviews that we have here on, on the Nexus, of course you should go look at our second opinion feed for some reviews from previous phones and future phones such as the iPhone XS Max and family. And of course, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryanamar. And of course, on my website, ryanamarpreset.com, you can find our subreddit on reddit, r slash the Nexus TV. And of course, you can find us on Patreon, where you can support us at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. And of course, maybe uh, you like reviewing phones just like I do. Maybe you have a phone to review. Feel free. Contact us, let us know, and tell us what you want us to review, or offer to come on and we'll let you review whatever you want. Have a good one. Oh, listen to me. I'm Ryan, and I buy 3.5 phones per year because I print money. Oops, was that microphone on? The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. convergence. Tech news is dominated by big announcements with big, bombastic personalities. Developers, 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 developers. Sometimes they make us laugh. Yes, I'd like to order 4,000 lattes to go, please. Sometimes we laugh at them. Courage. Sometimes we're filled with awe. There it is. Whoa! Check that out. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes they throw shade. Toxic hell stew. Sometimes they inspire. Live, learn, and love. They never want us to forget. Remember that the show's never over because I got one more thing. Now, it's often difficult to make the journey to see these events live. This oh, is a freaking dirt road. Oh my god. <laughs> but we here at the Nexus TV have got you covered. On our show, Nexus Special, we recap and analyze all the biggest announcements and keynote events in the tech world. So come join us as we explore the brave new worlds that await us. Subscribe to Nexus Special in your favorite podcast player today.